Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the January 26, 2022 uh, Mound Science and Energy Museum presentation. Uh, this month's topic is something a little different for us. It's the history of Mimesburg beer. So we're going to get a, a fair amount of exposure to local history uh, and a hobby of many people is enjoying beer and the connection to it. Uh, our Presenter tonight is Tim Gaffney, who is a Dayton native, but has lived in Mimesburg for over 40 years, basically at the foot of Mound Hill. So he has a lot of tie in with Mimesburg. He was worked for the Dayton Daily News. And also the, after retiring from there, he worked at the National Aviation Heritage Alliance. Uh, Tim is the author of more than 16 published books including his latest one, which is Dayton Beer, A History of Be uh, Brewing in Noemi Valley. Tonight, he's going to follow up with some more research that he performed, focusing on the history of beer making and uh, in Mimesburg. So without further ado, here is Tim and welcome aboard. Okay, well, th thanks, Bob, and thanks everyone for joining in tonight. In 2019, Arcadia released my book, Dayton Beer. It included a short chapter about early Miami's bird brewers. The chapter gives as much as I could yeah, in the time I had to research it, but it left a lot of unanswered questions. Since then, I've continued to research Miami's bird's early brewers, right up to this week, in fact, not only the brewers themselves, but also how they influenced and how they were influenced by the times they lived in. To me, learning their stories is like opening a window into our local history. So much of what I'm gonna share with you tonight, you won't find in my book or in any other book, but I hope it gives you some glimpses into Miamisburg history that you haven't had before. Now I'm gonna start up some slides here so you don't have to look at me all night. <clears throat> One of the questions I wanted to answer was, where could Miami's Bird's pioneers get a beer in 1811? Anywhere? Miami's Bird dates its history back to 1818 when the town was platted. But the town's history really began in the late 1790s. That's when Zachariah Hull brought his family from Virginia and built a small settlement on the east bank of the Great Miami River, right across from Bear Creek. Daniel Gebhardt built a tavern here in 1811. Philip Hewitt built a flour mill the next year on the north side of Sycamore Creek and soon added other mills, including a distillery. Could there have been a brewery too? It wouldn't have surprised me. In my research, I found breweries were among the first businesses in frontier settlements, not far, not far behind grist mills and distilleries. For example, up in Dayton, George Newcomb's famous tavern had a brewery added sometime between 1808 and 1810. In Piqua, beer was said to have been available before 1812. Xenia got its first brewery around 1805. But so far, I've found no sign of a commercial brewery that early in Miamisburg, although Gebhardt's Tavern might well have served whiskey from Hewitt's distillery. In those years, Miamisburg was still emerging from the wilderness. The town laid out in 1808 was tiny. This plant map shows how Miamisburg looked then. The river is on the left, and the square in the middle is today's Market Square. Over on the east side, running north and south, was what we call First Street today. So the whole town lay between the river and what's now First Street. Now, First Street was once labeled Canal Street, 
And I assume that's because the Miami and Erie Canal would take a path up the east side of town, right alongside first, what's now First Street. <clears throat> the first public reference I found to a brewery in Miamisburg was, with, was in the 1837 edition of the Ohio Gazetteer and Traveler's Guide. Here's what it said Miamisburg contained at the time. One cotton mill, one iron foundry, one brass foundry, two grist mills, one steam saw mill, besides other mills in its vicinity, 143 dwelling houses, 10 stores, three warehouses, two churches, two schoolhouses, a market house, two pork houses, one drugstore, three taverns, six groceries, one brewery, one tannery, and about 40 mechanics shops of various descriptions. It described Miamisburg's residents as a thriving and wealthy population of German farmers. In fact, many of the first settlers in Miami and German townships were of German descent from Pennsylvania. And it shouldn't surprise you to learn that nearly every brewer, not only here, but across the Miami Valley was from Germany. So I would only be surprised if Miamisburg didn't have a brewery by 1837. But where was that brewery? How long had it been there? And who built it? Trying to answer those questions took me back into Montgomery County's earliest records, including bound volumes of crumbling handwritten deed, mortgage, and court records, newspaper articles on microfilm, and copies of census, birth, death, estate, and other records that I found in genealogical databases. I still don't have all the answers, but my research has yielded enough details for me to form a theory. My theory is that the brewery mentioned in the 1837 Gazetteer stood where the Miamisburg Civic Center is today on the east side of First Street, about halfway between Central and aligned even with Ferry Street. And because of a lack of any evidence of an earlier brewery, I believe there's a good chance that it was Miamisburg's first. <clears throat> Excuse me. A brewery in that location was literally on the map by 1851. Here's a map of Miamisburg from the 1851 Montgomery County Atlas. Here's, uh, here's the canal running through town. Now, the, this map was printed sideways, so north is to the right. But here's the canal running south to north along what was then Canal Street. <clears throat> Down here is the footprint of a small structure between Canal and Canal Street, or what's now First Street. The inset sh shows that it's even labeled with the word brewery. Whoever drew that map back in 1851 either really liked beer or else the brewery had been around long enough and was well enough known for it to qualify as a local landmark. And I found deed records going back to the 1840s that described this property as known as the brewery lot. As I kept digging, and I have to admit it got somewhat obsessive, I was able to document the brewery's history even farther back. <clears throat> but I also learned that the story of this brewery and all the land under the Civic Center has its roots in the history of the Miami and Erie Canal. Excuse me. <clears throat> In the late 1820s, gangs of workers dug the canal by hand between Dayton and Cincinnati. When it opened in 1829, it gave people and local businesses in the Miami Valley a way to travel and ship goods down to the Ohio River and from there to ports all the way to New Orleans. In the 1830s and 40s, the canal was extended northward all the way to Lake Erie. The canal immediately spurred economic growth in Miamisburg, especially around two points. One point was at the canal lock at what was then the south end of town. At the lock, a short branch of the canal provided water power for several mills 
creating a small manufacturing district. And here, if you follow the arrow, you can see the lock. And then here's the footprints of the mills that were there. <clears throat> now, as it happens, this location is now home to our two microbreweries, Star City Brewing and Lucky Star Brewery. The other point was in the north end of town where I found the brewery between the canal and what's now First Street. It's much different today because the ground is covered by the Civic Center. But this county map detail shows the path the canal followed across the land where the Civic Center is now. <clears throat> it's within this blue border. And you can see how the canal and Canal Street, or what's now First, formed a wedge of land right here. It's this wedge that I'm going to focus on for the next few minutes. Now here's the same area as it looked on the 1851 map. I've turned the map so that north is at the top. Here's the canal running this way. Here's the brewery. And above it, just north of Ferry Street, notice this square that is simply labeled Basin. That basin was an important geographical detail. As this land was divided into lots, the boundaries were often measured using, it, using the basin as a reference point. <clears throat> Deed records identify it as Murray's Basin. Now, Murray is a name I'd never come across. You won't find it in accounts of Miamisburg's early settlers. But I dug a few details out of history books about Delaware, Ohio, and Indiana, genealogical records, and government, state government reports. I found that Elias Murray was an early Ohio settler from New York who moved to Delaware, Ohio, and made a name for himself commanding an Ohio militia cavalry in the War of 1812. Murray was also a second cousin to Samuel Huntington, Ohio's third governor. That may have helped him get elected to the Ohio House of Representatives in the early 1820s, just in time for him to cast a vote in favor of the 1825 bill authorizing construction of the Miami and Erie Canal. He left the legislature right after that, but his name soon popped up on the Ohio Canal Commission's long list of contractors that it paid to plan, survey, and build the canal. Around 1830, Murray left Ohio for Indiana, where he got involved with the building of the Wabash and Erie Canal, and also founded the city of Huntington, which, fun fact, he named for Ohio's governor, Samuel Huntington. Surprise, Indiana. Local history books about Delaware and Huntington mention Murray, but they're silent about the time he, about the time he spent between those two places. But Montgomery County deed records reveal that between 1828 and 1830, Murray was living here in Miamisburg. That was the year he bought that wedge of land from pioneer Jacob Kircher. This was before the canal was opened, but Murray's work in the Ohio State House and the Canal Commission would have put him in good position to see its potential. <clears throat> In the short time he was here, Murray and his basin turned this little strip of land into a budding commercial district. The basin gave canal boats a place to pull off and load or unload cargo. Murray sold off his land in small lots and warehouses and small businesses sprang up on them. In 1834, a man named David H. Hoover bought a piece of this land. It was a lot south of Murray's basin. In fact, it was this lot where the brewery was labeled later. <clears throat> David's brother, Martin, bought a half interest in it. This was the same piece of ground that the brewery would occupy. Now, deed records from 1834 say nothing about a brewery, but they mentioned that the property included a warehouse. David and Martin also bought a small piece of an adjacent lot that would become known to have a malt house. That's a facility where grain is malted or prepared for brewing. From then on, these two parcels would be bought and sold together as a single unit. For reasons I'll explain, 
David H., I believe David H. Hoover bought the property in 1834 with the aim of turning the warehouse into a commercial beer brewery. Martin Hoover joined in, but David was first, and Martin later sold his share and left the county. <clears throat> if this was Miami's Bird's first brewery, that makes David Hoover Miami's Bird's earliest known brewer, which begs the question, who was David Hoover? David H. Hoover was born in Pennsylvania, but his family moved to the Miamisburg area when he was young, and he grew up on the family farm. Local history remembers him as a successful manufacturer of farm machinery and the father of, of the even more successful Abel Hoover. Biographical sketches date Hoover's career from 1841 when they say he partnered with a man named Watson in a business making grain separators down near the canal lock. In the 1850s, Hoover struck out on his own as D.H. Hoover. Eventually, Abel joined him and they did business as Hoover and Son. David Hoover died in 1870, but his son carried on the business with his brother-in-law, William Gamble. Hoover and Gamble became a manufacturing powerhouse. It grew the Excelsior line of reapers and mowers that David Hoover had started. Its factory buildings dominated third, South Third Street from Bridge Street, what's now Linden Avenue, to the south end of town. So much so that in those days, South Third was known as Excelsior Street. And then you can see Excelsior within this blue triangle. There's a bridge or Linden Avenue. Excelsior is what Third Street is now. <clears throat> By 1886, Hoover and Gamble had expanded to manufacture machinery for binding or baling crops with twine. The Excelsior Twine Binder and Mower Works is the centerpiece of Miamisburg's 1886 lithograph. That's it there, and there's the expanded view. <clears throat> Did this climb to the apex of Miamisburg's industry start with a brewery back in 1834? I haven't found any published work that mentions Hoover as a brewer, but I know this much. In October 1839, Martin Hoover sold his half interest in the brewery lot to a man named Joseph Watson. Remember, David Hoover started his farm machinery business as a partner with someone named Watson. Were these two Watsons the same person? I can't say for sure, but it seems likely, especially since Hoover and Joseph Watson had family ties. Their wives were two sisters from the Houts family, Catherine and Nancy. In November 1840, just a year after Joseph Watson had bought out Martin Hoover, David Hoover and Watson mortgaged a piece of the brewery, of the brewery property to a William Sawyer. It was the parcel that David and Martin had added onto the brewery lot. And the mortgage noted that the property included a brick malt house. This was an important find for my research because it's the earliest explicit reference I found to something connected to brewing. <clears throat> now, it's only circumstantial evidence that Hoover and Watson by then had a brewery on the adjoining lot. But if you're a fan of the old TV show Law and Order, I think you'd say it's admissible. It also offers a reason why the Hoover brothers wanted that parcel back in 1834. It might have provided land they needed for a malt house to feed their brewery or it might already have held a building that could be turned into one. <clears throat> so at the very least, I think it offers strong evidence that Hoover had a brewery going in time for it to be counted in the 1837 Gazetteer and likely a few years earlier. Now, Hoover and Watson have more going on than a brewery. They each own some other properties near the canal basin. And Watson had been involved in his farm machinery business in the south end of town for a few years. But there were signs of trouble. Common police court records show two separate lawsuits in 1838 against 
the partnership of Hoover and Watson for failure to deliver goods that it had been paid for. The records don't say if they were being sued in connection with their brewery or some other reason, maybe their machinery business. And I don't know if these 1838 lawsuits had anything to do with why they mortgaged the malt house. All I know is that days after they got that mortgage, Hoover bought out Watson's half interest in the, in the brewery property. <clears throat> and Hoover was separately sued, sued in 1842 for another failure to deliver some unspecified goods. I only have a murky view of the situation, but it came at a time when something much bigger was rocking the whole country, the Panic of 1837. In the 1830s, America's financial system was a mess. The federal government had yet to settle on a coherent banking policy and state banks printed their own money. <clears throat> Inflation soared until 1837 when a run on the banks caused hundreds to close their doors. Unemployment soared across the country. New York saw food riots. This political cartoon shows a man with no food to feed his family and creditors at the door. The situation was less dire in Ohio, but it said thousands of people lost their jobs and many families lost their life savings. The economy didn't begin to recover until the early 1830s or 1840s. Local history books don't say how the Panic of 1837 played out here in Miamisburg, but it does appear that David Hoover was having financial problems that seemed to reach the breaking point in 1842. That year, he filed a document called a Record of Assignment. It assigned his real and personal property to Emanuel Gebhardt, who was, who was to sell it off and distribute the money equally to a long list of Hoover's creditors. Hoover cast himself as a victim of circumstance, blaming his predicament on the misfortunes of trade and change of times. Besides revealing Hoover's financial woes, the assignment record makes the first explicit reference to his brewery. The assignment included all my stock of ale, beer, and porter on hand, and all grain and apparatus belonging to my brew house. <clears throat> that wasn't all. The assignment included property that Hoover owned on the north side of the canal basin, which he described as the place where he lived, complete with household furniture, a windmill, and even one blind horse. But I found no records of any property actually changing hands as a result of this assignment. And in 1843, another of Hoover's creditors sued him. This time, the court ordered the brewery and malt house properties sold together in a sheriff's auction. That appears to have ended Hoover's brewing days. Somehow he recovered and he found success in the farm machinery business, first with Watson, then on his own, and finally with his son, Abel. So despite whatever was going on in the early 1840s, history remembers David H. Hoover as an important Miamisburg manufacturer, not its first but failed brewer. But this isn't the end of the story for the brewery. Another Miamisburger, John Schwartztrauber, bought it in 1843 in that sheriff's auction for a little less than $1,200. Schwartztrauber owned it for about five years before losing it himself in another sheriff's auction. The brewery changed hands a couple of times that year until a man named Charles Schrouder bought it in November 1848. By then, Miamisburg was a well-established village with a thriving downtown. This 1850 illustration is a view looking north on Main Street, probably from what's now Central Avenue. Schrouder owned the brewery for a little over five years before selling it in 1853. He had it just long enough for Riley's Ohio State Business Directory for that year to list him as the sole, brewer, as the sole brewer for Miamisburg. This is the first published record I found that names the brewer here. Schrouder has proved to be an elusive figure. Handwritten census records show a brewer with a name similar to Schrouder living in the township in 1850. 
they reveal only that he was born about 1824 and came from Germany or Pennsylvania. He had a wife named Catherine Goth or Koth or Cody, and they had a daughter named Eliza or Eloise. But that's all I've learned about him. How long did he live here? Where is he buried? Who are his descendants? I've found no clues to any of that information. The brewery, brewery lot continued to change hands many times after that, but I haven't learned how long the brewery stayed in business or what became of it. I never found a name for it or found any advertisements other than that single listing for Shrouder, who remains a mystery. But just a few blocks away, Another brewery was on the scene by 1860, the Miamisburg Brewery. It's the earliest brewery that I can pin a name to. Now here's Ferry Street, although on this map, it's misspelled as Perry. The brewery stood along the river south of Ferry, <clears throat> somewhere on lots 148, 149, and 150. The land, the land is along the levee, at the north end of what is now Riverfront Park, which is all this area here, <clears throat> or uh, all this area here. I haven't learned exactly when this brewery was built either. It may well have been in business while Shrouders was still going just a few blocks away. They were likely very small as were most breweries were in the 1850s, serving just their immediate neighborhoods. And Miamisburg was brewing, it was <laughs> booming. Census records showed its population swelled by more than 50% in a single decade from just under 1100 in 1850 to more than 1600 by 1860. But if it's hard to imagine two local breweries just a few blocks apart, remember we have two local brew pubs today and they're just one block apart. Here's what I know about the Miamisburg Brewery. In 1852, a Bavarian immigrant came to town named George Wilhelm Nuss or William Nuss. In 1854, he married a Prussian immigrant named Margaret Herman. Margaret was the daughter of local farmers, John and Susanna Herman, and she had a brother named Philip. At least by 1856, John Herman owned lot 147. That same year, he bought the two lots south of it, 148 and 149, and a nine foot section of lot 150. In 1859, Nuss bought the remainder of lot 150. <clears throat> the next year, 1860, John Herman gave lots 148, 149, and his piece of lot 150 to Margaret and Philip. The deed noted the gift included all personal property belonging to the brewery, which stands on the above described real estate. So we know there was a brewery there by 1860, and we can assume it had been there for some time. That same year, 1860, a state business directory listed Nuts and Herman as proprietors of the Miamisburg Brewery. So Nuss was in the brewing business with the Hermans at least by 1860 and very possibly earlier. As we saw with the other brewery, changes in street names can cause confusion. So it is here. Back then, Water Street, <clears throat> back then Water Street was where North Miami Street is today. Water Street uh, and what we call Water Street now runs between Miami and Main Street. But back then, this was Water Street, right along the river. Nuss advertised his brewery in Miamisburg's weekly newspaper, The Bulletin. The earliest edition I have found is from 1867, but this ad on the left was in it. Nuss's brother-in-law, Philip Herman, had worked at the brewery for some years, but this ad only mentions Nuss. It suggests that 
at least by 1867, he was sole proprietor. Nuss advertised the Miamisburg Brewery regularly, but starting in November 1872, he made an important change in the ad. He started calling his brewery the Miami Valley Brewery. It's a sign that Nuss was leaving or had already left the Miamisburg Brewery up on Water Street to a new, bigger one south of town. The new brewery's exact location is difficult to pin down. Here's the 1886, uh, excuse me, got ahead of myself. The new brewery stood on a large track in Miami Township that Nuss bought and platted. It was about where the Miamisburg Dog Park is today. Here's an aerial picture of the area that I took about a year ago. I layered on a copy of the original plant map to show it the location of the brewery. I layered it's between the Miami and what was in the Miami and Erie Canal and the foot of Mound Hill. It marks a separate bottling house to the east and a barn to the south. Skirting it was a brand new railroad, the Cleveland, Cincinnati, Chicago, and St. Louis Railway, AKA the Big Four. The brewery's exact location is difficult to pin down. Here's the 1886 lithograph of Miamisburg. A picture of the brewery is one of the featured images along the border of the lithograph. <clears throat> now this featured image shows the brewery just across a road from the, cana from the canal, and this is the canal running here. In this location, the railroad would have had to have passed behind the brewery. But the wide view on the lithograph shows the brewery here, and here's an enlarged view. And it shows the brewery farther to the east with the railroad running in front of the brewery or between the brewery and the canal. <clears throat> Other maps agree with this version. It's hard to visualize now, in part because the railroad was relocated in 1910 in a major project that cut through the hill. It seems like a minor detail, but had the cut been made a decade or so earlier, it might have changed the brewery's history. So this featured drawing might not show, show in its exact location, but its layout generally agrees with later insurance maps. It's also the only picture I've seen of a Miamisburg brewery from the 19th century. William and Margaret moved into an apartment above the brewery. In those days, it wasn't unusual for a business owner's family to live in the same building as the business. Nuss found himself brewing beer for a growing community. Between 1860 and 1880, Miami's population grew by nearly 20% from about 1,600 residents to nearly 2,000. By the late 1870s, the Miami Valley Brewery was turning out about 1,000 barrels per year, according to an 1880 book uh, about America's brewing industry. In the meantime, what was happening at Nuss's old brewery up on Water Street? Nuss family residents, Nuss family descendants tell me the buildings were eventually turned into apartments where family members continued to live until the 1950s. They told me their grandmother lived in an apartment that she believed was a part of the old brewery, possibly its bottling works. And the granddaughter sent me this picture of a bottle embossed with the words, John Nuss, Miamisburg. John Nuss was William's son. The bottle is a hint that John acquired his own brewery while records show he continued to live on Water Street. It seems most likely that John kept the old Miamisburg brewery going, presumably serving its immediate neighborhood. That would explain why William used a different name for his new brewery. The building itself apparently stood for generations, but no Nuss is listed in connection, in connection with the brewery after 1881 when William Nuss died. 
The name of William Nuss is forgotten today, but he was a brewer for at least 21 years, the longest of any Miamisburg brewer on record. Nuss's funeral was a measure of how well he was known and how highly regarded. The funeral took place at the St. Jacob Lutheran Evangelical Church in the center of town. Mourners from up and down the Miami Valley filled the sanctuary. The Dayton Journal called the funeral one of the largest witnessed here for some time. The Apollo Band of Hamilton, which was well known around the region then, played at the service. Today, William Nuss and Margaret rest beneath the Herman family monument, one of the tallest in Hillgrove Cemetery. A year after William died, his widow Margaret sold the Miami Valley Brewery. It changed hands again a year later that year. It appears the brewery may have been closed for a while, but just over a year later in October, 1882, an ad in the bulletin announced that a new company had been formed. It was called the Miami Valley Brewing Company and the ad promised it would soon have Nuss's old brewery back online. It would do business as the Miamisburg Brewery. To be clear, this was the brewery at the foot of Mound Hill. The name change to Miamisburg Brewery is a hint that the old Miamisburg Brewery up on Water Street was no longer doing business. The new enterprise was the work of Victor Keen, who had bought the brewery for $21,000. Now, earlier I mentioned that nearly every brewer in the Miami Valley was a German immigrant. Every early brewer in the Miami Valley was a German immigrant. I was surprised to learn that Keen was born in France but he was a German by the time he arrived in the United States. That's because his homeland was in the Alsace region. The German empire annexed it from France in 1871 and Keene immigrated the next year. He made his way to Cincinnati and became a brewer in what was then one of Cincinnati's biggest, the Jackson Brewery. Somehow, and for reasons I haven't learned, Keene had the desire and apparently the means to own his own brewery. Keene's ad in October 1882, which you see here, promised beer would be available by December. But that ad kept running until June 1883, when it finally declared it was ready to deliver beer. This slide shows my book cover. And I put a picture of Keene on the back. This shows him years later on a visit to Germany but it's the first picture I found, and one of only two, that shows the face of a Miami's Bird Brewer. Keene's Brewery must have prospered. In 1885, he boasted in an ad in the bulletin that no expense has been spared in refitting this establishment with modern appliances and machinery. <clears throat> This 1886 Sanborn insurance map shows the brewery's layout. The main building was the brew house. Attached structures included a malt house, an ice house, a coal shed, and a wagon shed. Below ground were fermenting and storage cellars. On the Eastern side of the lot stood the bottling works, <clears throat> and to the south were a barn and hog pens. I, the hog pens, I assume, were, were where the brewery spent grains were converted to pork. The brewery also included hen houses, and up on the hill was a 300 barrel cistern that supplied the brewery with water. The Keens lived on the third floor over the brew house. The Miami, Valley, the Miami Valley Brewery was small compared to bigger breweries up in Dayton and the even bigger ones in Cincinnati, but it was the scene of one of the most dramatic events I found in all the history of Miami Valley's breweries. It made newspaper headlines near and far. It's hard to believe it hasn't stayed alive in Miamisburg's legends and lore. Close to midnight on Sunday, January 2nd, 1887, a gang of men broke into the brewery. 
The bulletin reported that one stood guard at each entrance and another watched the stairway leading up to the Keene's apartment. Two others drilled, hole, drilled into the safe in the second floor office directly below where the Keens were sleeping. The commotion woke them. Victor Keene grabbed his revolver and went to investigate. But when he opened the stairway door, the man below fired up at him. They exchanged gunfire while Catherine screamed out the window for help. Keene also traded shots out the window with one of the other robbers. Other newspapers say the robbers blew the safe open. The bulletin reported that they forced it open to find exactly one penny in the cash drawer. Keene kept the brewery's money in the, in the town's bank. <clears throat> Other reports also speculated that the gang left town on a midnight train, but I like the bulletin's version better. It said they ran down the railroad tracks and crossed the river on the ice, then made their getaway in a waiting horse-drawn sleigh. Whip cracking, bells jingling, and all the men singing as if they were just out on a late night joyride. The safe cracking caper wasn't the only excitement at Keene's Brewery. Fire struck early on the morning of March 25th, 1889. The March 29 bulletin reported that flames destroyed the whole upper floor of the establishment. Had the fire broken out at midnight, the story continued, the whole family might have perished. The bulletin optimistically predicted that Keene would quickly repair the brewery, but on April 12th, it announced that he was returning to Cincinnati. Keene eventually settled in Marietta, where he became president of the Marietta Brewing Company. The brewery seems to have been closed for the next three years. The 1892 Sanborn insurance map marks it as such. But in October of that year, Henry P. Deutscher of Butler County formed a new corporation, the Miamisburg Brewing Company. Another German immigrant, Deutscher owned the H.P. Deutscher Manufacturing Company in Hamilton, as well as other companies, including a malt house. Deutscher's new company bought the brewery from the Keens and put it back in business. This portrait of Deutscher is the only other image I've found that shows the face of a Miamisburg brewer or brewery owner from the 19th century. Deutscher actually continued to live in Butler County. He assigned one of his plant managers, Henry Graff, to run the brewery, but Deutscher invested in the brewery. One big improvement he made was refrigeration. <clears throat> Refrigeration is critical to keeping beer fresh and cold, especially lager beer, which has to be fermented and cold and stored in cold temperatures. Until the late 19th century, refrigeration mainly involved harvesting blocks of ice off of lakes, streams, and ponds. Commercial ice ponds dotted the Miami Valley along the Miami and Erie Canal. The canal provided water for the ponds and transportation for the ice, especially to the big Cincinnati breweries. Here on the left is an illustration of the Cullen Ice Works in Butler County. Near the brewery uh, in Miamisburg, or near the uh, Miami Valley Brewery was an ice pond. It's drawn on this 1893 plat map of the Miami and Erie Canal. It was located on the east side of the canal, just north of the brewery. I haven't learned if it supplied the brewery with ice, but I'd be surprised if it didn't. Refrigeration meant beer, meat, and other foods could be stored safely at, in any season. It made, it made ice ponds obsolete. The refrigeration industry took off in the late 19th century and brewers were an important part of the market. A refrigeration plant could produce cold water, brine, or ice to chill fermenting tanks and cellars throughout the year. It made lager beer available all year long. It was also cheaper and made with distilled water much more sanitary than pond ice. By 1896, Miamisburg Brewing replaced its ice house with a refrigeration plant. <clears throat> and just uh, two years later in 1898, it doubled its capacity with a new plant from the Frick Company in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania. The new machine was one of Frick's smaller Eclipse models like the one pictured here. 
the new machine, uh, but it could turn out 20 tons of ice a day. Besides keeping beer cold, refrigeration machines gave breweries a new product to sell, ice for home ice boxes. By August 1899, Miamisburg Brewing advertised absolutely pure artificial ice. As the brewery entered the 20th century with a new ice plant, Miamisburg was still booming. Between 1890 and 1900, its population nearly doubled from 2,000 to just under 4,000. The future must have looked bright for Miamisburg Brewing. But the story of Miamisburg's early brewers ends with fire, not ice. The blaze that shuttered the brewery in 1889 was just a preview. On June 20, 1898, another fire struck the brewery, and once again, most of the upper floor was burned. Miamisburg Brewery, Miamisburg Brewing appeared to stay in business, but the worst is, was yet to come. The Miamisburg News described what happened. Shortly before noon on Tuesday, May 8th, 1900, a train rumbled past the brewery, its coal-fired steam locomotive billowing smoke. Minutes later, a brewery worker spotted flames in the stable on the south side of the brewery. He shouted an alarm, but it was a windy day and the wind fanned the flames. The fire quickly leaped to the brew house. No people died, but five horses perished in the stable and the brew house burned to the ground. Deutscher's company sued the railroad. It blamed the fire on embers from the passing locomotive. Had the railroad already been relocated through the cut, putting the locomotive downwind from the brewery and farther away, the fire might never have happened. But the cut was 10 years in the future, and this was the end of the line for Miamisburg's brewery. By then, breweries pr were proliferating in the Miami Valley, and the big national brands were penetrating local markets. The brewery was never rebuilt. Miamisburg saloons wouldn't want for beer, but, for, but more than a century would pass before the Star City could enjoy its own hometown brew. <laughs> Today, brewing is back. Miamisburg is now home to two microbreweries, Star City Brewing and Lucky Star Brewery and Cantina. They're both located in historic buildings from the canal era, just a block apart on South 2nd Street. I have to say, I've been thinking about writing another book just about Miamisburg's early brewers, but I still have a lot to learn about them. I've heard from descendants of August Keen and William Nuss. I'd love to hear from anyone else who has stories or information about Miamisburg's early brewers. In the meantime, Here's where you can find my book, Date and Beer. It's at uh, Walgreens Pharmacy, Barnes and Noble Booksellers, Carillon Historical Park Gift Shop, and Carillon Brewing. And it's available online from a number of places, including amazon.com. Now, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be glad to take them. And you can also contact me at Dayton Beer Book at gmail.com. So if you have some, info, especially if you have some information about any of these early brewers or their breweries, I would love to hear from you. Uh, and with that, I'll go back to my lovely face. Let's see, stop the chair. There we are. Thank you, Tim. You now with a bit of history and <laughs> certainly a convoluted uh, <clears throat> operation of breweries in the city of Mimesburg over the years, the village of Mimesburg. It, it, it was a little bit tricky to, to explain because um, so much of the infra, these, these, the stories about these breweries aren't really recorded anywhere. Um, I had to dig it out of all these different uh, records and often I just had to take hints and clues and put them together to form a picture of, of what was going on. Um, so it is a little bit convoluted and, and gets a little bit confusing. But, you know, there must have been a lot of beer drinking going on in Miamisburg in those days. 
you would think with them building the railroad and building the canals that the workers would like beer. And so um, it's quite interesting. I did have one question and hopefully somebody else will have something. The brewery yeah, that was on the Yeah. <clears throat> uh, it, on the, the brewery that was on the east side of Miami River, was it ever flooded? I mean, if you knew the time thing, because the Great Miami flooded a number of times besides 1913. I just don't remember the dates. But did you ever do you know any correlation of that? Well, again, I, I just don't have any specific information about the brewery in those days. Only only you know where it's mentioned on a on a census uh, or, yeah. or on a deed record or or something like that. Uh, but yeah, they must have been interesting times because Miamisburg, uh, there was a major flood. When was it? In the, around in the early 1860s. I, that's uh, what I recall. There was at least two. That other was yeah. Floods. That was the great flood until that was the great 13. flood until 1913. <laughs> yeah. So. And then there were earlier floods before that. Um, so there, you know, there have to have been some some really fascinating stories about those times. And people didn't document them or. or or whatever got lost so but uh, you know probably that kind of information if it exists anywhere it's in some trove of family letters somewhere yeah. in a shoebox yeah. or an attic <laughs> well hopefully somebody will pull that, them would out. The, that would be the gold mine <laughs> yeah for the history of my story. so jack is there anybody else raising hands or want to get unmuted uh this is gary i'd like to ask a question um, what other breweries were in the area, uh, or what's the next well, these, closest brewery that was in the area, and who were they? These are the. Go ahead. No. Uh, these the breweries that I've talked about are the only ones I I found any evidence of in Miamisburg. Now, outside of Miamisburg, I really didn't research the other areas. Uh, in Southern Montgomery County, except for Dayton. And that's that's mainly because of the amount of time I had and the uh, amount of space I had in the book. It, uh, this was under a contract with a deadline and a specific number of words and pictures <laughs> that the editor wanted. So uh, it was kind of a it was kind of a long uh, mad dash, but I wanted to make sure I included a chapter about my own hometown, Miamisburg, but I haven't really researched what was in uh, places like West Carrollton and, and things like that. Um, isn't that, wasn't, I mean, for this, the size of it, you know, were they just supplying Miamisburg, you know, beer to the town of Miamisburg or, you know, or Cincinnati probably, would have better distribution, I would assume. Oh yeah, yeah. The big breweries, the big breweries were up in Dayton and down in Cincinnati. Miamisburg was probably just supplying in its immediate area. Uh, with the canal, it may have gone, you know, down a little ways and up north uh, to Car West Carrollton, which I think was then Carrollton, you know, a little bit. But um, Middletown had its own breweries. Uh, it, it was it was one of the early brewery towns. And of course, Cincinnati had really big breweries. Now, um, Germantown had a brewery and I've still been researching it because up in Dayton, uh, when you research breweries, you find historical reports saying that uh, the Schimmel Brewery up in Dayton was the first place in the county that had lager beer starting around 1852. But I've seen accounts saying that there was a lager beer brewery in Germantown as early as 1830. And, you know, when you consider that all the early, almost all the early settlers uh, down here were, were German or German descendants, it, it would certainly stand to reason that they would want their lager. And then I had a question on your one of your first slides from the gazetteer you named yeah. like uh what they had in the town itself it was uh um, right the list of you know businesses it was one um 
It's one of your very first uh, slides from the, the Gazetteer. And I just did, you know, wanted to know if that was typical for a town that this small, or, I mean, it just seems a lot for a, a smaller town. Or is that yeah. common or uncommon? But I think it's, I think that's fairly common for towns that size at that time. And it, if you go through this Gazetteer, it gives little descriptions like this for just about every little town and township uh, in the yeah. state. Well, if, if for 143 <laughs> dwelling houses, there's 10 stores and two, you know. It's, right. It just, it just seems to me that's a lot, you know. But I, and, I, I yeah. I'm just curious. And, but who knows what they counted as stores back then? You know, sure. I, it's, it's hard to say. And I didn't um, know if that was with the canal being there. There was more, you know, things to ship. You know, people would ship yeah. stuff through the canal too. And there's a few things I don't see here. I see a I see a couple of foundries listed, but I don't see a blacksmith, and I don't see any coopers. Uh, every small town had at least one cooper. That was that was the guy who made the barrels that that everything was shipped in in those days. The you know in the 1800s the the barrel was the uh, was the cardboard box of the 19th century. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh huh. Anyone else have questions for <clears throat> M? Well, it certainly was interesting, Tim, and uh, making me think. I've left everybody stunned and speechless. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe they all want to get a beer now. I don't know. But uh, uh, well, well, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, like I said, Tim's working on a book, so maybe he'll have some more details coming up. But I want to invite you next month. We're going to have another uh, Mound Seminar on the 23rd. If the pandemic doesn't impact us much, we hope to have it live at the museum. Uh, Dave Bossmeyer, a, a Mound, uh, former Mound, retired Mound employee and, and a, a museum director, is going to share his experiences working on the engineering aspects of, of Mound Laboratory. So it uh, will be our talk and we got a couple others planned in the next couple of months. I'm hopeful that we can start having a few live ones as well, but this talk will be, is being recorded. It will be up on YouTube. So, you know, share it with your friends. Anybody that likes to, you know, those stories of beer or, or stories of Mimesburg, this is an opportunity to see it for free and get all those pretty videos and, and see Tim's uh, smiling face as he shares this, uh, his enthusiasm for our, our local history. Thanks again, Tim and everybody else for joining us. And have a, have a safe month, and uh, let's hope it doesn't snow too much. Good night, everyone. <laughs>